everyone. My, my name is Jackie Bonomo, and I am president of Penn Future, a statewide environmental watchdog organization working for clean air, clean water, a healthy climate, and clean energy. Uh, Penn Future and the Ohio River Valley Institute have come together today to bring you this hour to look at hydrogen, uh, the latest shiny object in our quest to find alternative sources of energy that will not kill our climate. But does hydrogen really fill that bill? That's what we're gonna be exploring today. Both of our organizations are, are voicing an early warning as hydrogen increasingly makes its way into legislative hearings, programs like Build Back Better, boardrooms, and speeches of elected officials. Our hope is that today we'll bring hydrogen and its relationship and viability to clean and renewable energy or lack thereof into better focus for all of you. I'm um, speaking for Penn Future alone. I'm comfortable asking the question, does some form of hydrogen source fuel have potential as a climate solution? Perhaps, but not in this moment, the climate friendly potential we need out of hydrogen is simply not ready for prime time. And in this moment, we have in front of us decades proven renewable energy technology ready for at scale development, very economically, and a workforce ready to go and do the work. What's clear and highly troubling though, is that Pennsylvania's fracked gas industry is aggressively marketing and greenwashing hydrogen as a savior for our planet, when really all that industry and its boosters want is to save their balance sheets using taxpayer subsidies, highly speculative technology, and lots of spin. So we're three days away from the world convening in Glasgow to contemplate our climate future. So the timing of today's conversation is perfect. Thanks again for being with us. And I wanna introduce our two presenters who are gonna be tag teaming our topics. We'll first hear from Eric DePlace. Eric is a research fellow at the Ohio River Valley Institute where he focuses on issues related to climate energy and infrastructure development. Eric's expertise garnered through two decades at Sightline Institute in the Pacific Northwest is helping communities in the Ohio River Valley grapple with both regions shared interests and, and issues around coal, oil and gas development. Eric has done authoritative work to roll back oil industry tax loopholes, halt dirty energy projects, defeat right wing property right initiatives, expose shady PR firms, advanced regional climate policy and much more. He's an accomplished writer whose work has been published at all the big name media outlets worldwide. And he also runs an independent consulting practice, Salish Strategies, where he guides philanthropic institutions. We also have Rob Altenberg. Rob is senior director of Penn Futures Energy Center and is one of Pennsylvania's foremost experts on climate and environment and energy issues and the industries associated with them. He brings up a, a solutions orientation to policy tables in Pennsylvania and throughout the United States through his deep technical policy and legal expertise. Rob speaks extensively and also is an author contributing to federal climate policy discussion in the second edition of the book, Climate Change and US Law. Rob spent uh, previously 22 years with the Department of Environmental Protection here in Pennsylvania, where he worked in the air program, analyzing emissions and forecasting air quality, among other work. Uh, while he was at DEP, he also served as an executive policy specialist, advising the governor's office and department executives on environmental and public health issues. Uh, I want to remind everyone that this web event is being recorded. And also you can post your questions for Eric and Rob in the chat box and in the question and answer box. And Jared Stone Cipher, Penn Futures Director of Media Relation will pose them to our panelists after the presentation. So with that, I will turn it over to you, uh, Eric. Thanks, Jackie, I, I appreciate the introduction. Um, and I'm gonna make use of the chat myself actually, um, sort of as a way of uh, footnoting some of the comments that I'll make today. Um, so uh, if you keep a look at, I'll put in a couple of resources from the Ohio River Valley Institute. Um, you know, maybe the, the best place to start with a discussion of hydrogen is to kind of call to mind, if you can, uh, an image of the Hindenburg, uh, which is the famous blimp 
um, that um, was full of uh, uh, inflated with, uh, you know, a, a gas we're going to talk about today. Uh, and seemed like a really good idea at the time until it um, sort of exploded and ruined everything. Um, and there's, a, you know, I don't want to make light of a disaster that happened a long time ago, but there's something that's um, not too terrible an analogy between um, the Hindenburg disaster, one of our earliest hydrogen disasters, um, and what's um, sort of looming on the horizon right now with respect to public policy. Um, there's been a tremendous amount of interest in um, two sort of related issues, and you've probably heard about them all um, in the news recently. Um, there's the issue of hydrogen and a, sort of a multicolored approach to hydrogen, which I'll explain in a second. And also carbon capture and sequestration or carbon capture utilization and sequestration, CCUS as it's become called. Uh, we're gonna talk about that one just a tiny bit because it's it's relevant to hydrogen um, and talk a bit more about hydrogen. One of the the, the challenges with, with talking about hydrogen though, um, that I'll spend the first couple of minutes today talking about, and I think Rob will go a little deeper, is just understanding sort of the, the basic elements of it. Um, we are all being barraged with um, sort of competing claims that hydrogen is this uh, clean new fuel that will is capable of powering our economy with you know low or zero emissions. And on the other hand, we hear that no, in fact, hydrogen is actually just fossil fuel by another name. Um, to understand what's going on there, uh, we're gonna sort of do a very quick kind of glossary definition uh, of the, the three main colors of hydrogen. Uh, gray, blue, and green. Uh, there are some others that you'll hear about occasionally like turquoise or pink, and we can get into that in Q&A if you want, but it's it, really the only ones that matter are gray, blue, and green. Gray hydrogen is um, the type of hydrogen that is um, that comprises about 95% of all the hydrogen that's produced now, and it's um, it comes from a steam reforming process um, using uh, natural gas, using methane, uh, to convert methane into, uh, into hydrogen fuel. Uh, then the hydrogen can be um, burned or used for other purposes, uh, often in industrial applications. That happens now, and that's been happening for a long time. Hydrogen is not a new fuel by any stretch of the imagination, um, but its its application has been fairly limited. What's new now are the uh, advent uh, or the almost advent of these two other uh, flavors uh, or two other colors of hydrogen, uh, blue hydrogen and uh, green hydrogen. So. Um, uh, blue hydrogen is exactly the same as gray hydrogen. That is, it, it is fundamentally about using fossil fuels, natural gas, methane that is, uh, to, uh, to produce hydrogen. So it's not any different than gray hydrogen, except that what the, the, the one feature that is different and that gives it the name blue rather than gray is that um, the carbon is supposed to be captured from the process of manufacturing hydrogen and then either stored or used for some other purpose where that carbon is theoretically sequestered below ground. So it's it's the notion of carbon capture and sequestration that makes gray hydrogen, blue hydrogen. And blue hydrogen is really kind of all the talk of the town, literally in Pittsburgh right now and many other places uh, in Pennsylvania and a few places in other parts of the region or the country too. Um, and it's it's a bad deal because it is, um, it is really directly related to the fossil fuel industry and really directly relies on the continued production of large quantities of natural gas to produce the fuel. It's just that the hydrogen comes through um, the, the, the end result rather than burning gas, you burn uh, a fuel that you've produced from gas. The third category, and that is often confused um, with the other two is green hydrogen. And green hydrogen, um, while not yet economically competitive, it may be competitive in 10 to 20 years. Let's keep our fingers crossed. I hope so. Green hydrogen is different because green hydrogen is produced from renewable energy sources. So solar, wind, or um, other sources like that, um, and uses a different process to actually, um, uh, an electrolysis process. To, and so it's using large quantities of renewable energy plus water to produce um, hydrogen fuel that can then be used um, in various applications. Like I said, that that green hydrogen is um, uh, very small right now. It's not likely to be cost competitive for a while, um, maybe a decade. Um, uh, some people think a decade. Some people think it could be longer than that. Um, and you know, if it is in fact the case um, that we can produce large quantities of hydrogen using uh, truly renewable electricity, that might be might be a good idea, except that there are, of course, other things that we can do with large quantities of renewable electricity, like electrify our transportation grid, uh, or electrify our power grid. Um, and so one, one of the big challenges when we, when we kind of step through, we, if we, once we've kind of moved to the glossary of hydrogen, think about gray hydrogen as being basically just fossil fuel production, blue hydrogen being fossil fuel production, 
um, but with some carbon capture technology tacked onto it that we're gonna explore a little bit later because carbon capture technology is pretty oversold at the moment. Um, and then green hydrogen, which may actually have some promise. Then the question is, well, which if any of those makes sense economically uh, or environmentally? And I think the argument that I'll be making today in the course of this conversation with Rob, and then I suspect Rob will be making too in a slightly different way, is that it doesn't make a ton of sense in most cases to use hydrogen really for anything. Uh, if we can produce, if we have so much clean energy that we can use it to produce hydrogen, we could take that clean energy and produce and use it for other purposes where it's much more straightforward, more cost-effective and um, less complicated and doesn't have any of the sort of risks of hydrogen associated with it. Uh, and that, that really applies to um, applications like home heating, like transportation, probably a bunch of other stuff too. That being said, there are probably a few niche applications where hydrogen does make sense. Um, and those are, you know, particularly sort of high heat industrial processes, maybe like cement, like steel making, maybe glass, some others, where it is really useful to have a fuel like hydrogen. So it, the argument, the contention that I'll make, and I'll stop talking in just a moment, is that to the extent that we can produce um, any quantity of truly green hydrogen that does have a climate benefit, what we ought to do is is make sure that that is applied to the, the few industrial processes where we really need something like that, that we can't decarbonize otherwise, that we, where right now we're relying on gas or an oil product to produce it. We could replace that gas or oil product with, with green hydrogen. And that would be a net win for the climate. If we start using hydrogen for other things though, and we'll get into this more, um, we're probably just crowding out clean energy and causing other problems. With that, I'm gonna pause. Uh, I've got lots more to say later on and we've got a Q and A um, toward the end of this, but um, I've probably overrun my time limit already. Uh, thanks everyone for being here. And thank you, Eric, and thank you, Jackie, for the introduction. Um, I'm going to uh, follow on a little bit of what Eric started, talk a little bit about the economics of hydrogen, what we have to do to make hydrogen work, and really talk about, you know, some of the, actually the, you know, physics and chemistry of, of the situation about, uh, you know, why we think hydrogen, you know, where, where hydrogen will have some applications and where it's really not likely to uh, ever, ever have applications. Uh, when we talk about the economics and making it work, we're talking about really all phases, production, storage, transportation, and end use. And I guess I should start off by saying what I mean when I talk about making hydrogen work. You know, having a research project, limited application somewhere that um, you know, works in a specific situation is one thing. But what we really need is a high confidence that hydrogen is going to scale enough to address the climate crisis in a meaningful way. Um, we hear a lot of uh, technologies, you pick up almost any technology magazine or I guess website these days, and there's always an amazing technology that's six to 10 years in the future before it becomes commercially viable. Um, with the state where we are now with the climate crisis, we cannot afford to wait six to 10 years to see if something becomes commercially viable. Uh, we have to focus on, on investing in solutions that we have a high confidence that they are going to work. Um, talking a little bit about the basic chemistry of hydrogen. Uh, hydrogen, H2, two hydrogen atoms joined together. Um, and hydrogen is very reactive. It likes to combine with other chemicals. So we don't see pools of hydrogen floating around. You know, if, we had, if I had a glass of hydrogen here in front of me, it would be, um, you know, go up in the atmosphere and just uh, and disperse. So we have to get it from places where it's bound in with other chemicals. And the two I'll talk about, there are uh, others, but the two main ones I'll talk about is sourcing it from water and sourcing it from methane. Uh, when hydrogen uh, combines with oxygen to make water, that actually releases a lot of energy. Um, when hydrogen burns, it's oxidizing. It's combining with oxygen to make water vapor. Um, you know, that's the process, that's the energy that's released um, when uh, for hydrogen. So to take water and turn it back into hydrogen, we have to put that energy in it. Uh, we don't get any free energy. So if hydrogen burning, hydrogen oxidizing creates energy, making hydrogen from water takes energy, uh, takes the same amount of energy. 
Uh, also for methane, you've got that same situation. You have, uh, you have uh, a car single carbon atom surrounded by four hydrogen atoms. Uh, those bonds, to break those hydrogen bonds, to liberate that hydrogen, we have to put energy in the system. So there's, there, we, we don't have a free energy source in any situation. Uh, Eric had talked about steam reforming methane. This is again, the most common, uh, by far the most common uh, way that hydrogen is produced. We start with methane. So we start with primarily frac gas at this point. Uh, we can take that methane uh, from the frac gas, combine it with water, combine it with heat that's coming from some source of energy generation. And that's gonna split up that uh, methane molecule, one carbon, four hydrogen. It's gonna split it up into hydrogen and uh, carbon monoxide, you know, eventually becoming CO2. Um, so you end up with a certain amount of hydrogen and a certain amount of uh, carbon dioxide. Now that hydrogen that you have, you've got a certain energy value in that hydrogen. You can burn it and do things with it. And in this case, you can burn that hydrogen and get more heat out of it than you put in to split it, to, to uh, split the methane. So that has a benefit there, but that's not the only energy you have to put into the system. There's a lot of wasted energy generating that initial heat to start the whole process. Trans, trans, you know, if that was electricity, you've got to send it over power lines, there's waste and all sorts of other inefficiencies. Um, and there's a lot of energy in the fracking process that has to go into that. So you're really not getting a whole lot of new energy out of the process, even with, even with steam, ref, steam reformation. Electrolysis, the other method is actually even worse. This is where you take water and you run electricity through the water and you split it into hydrogen and oxygen. And I think most people probably did this in high school chemistry uh, somewhere along the way. Um, and so you, the good thing about it is, well, hydrogen and oxygen, neither, uh, neither of them are carbon pollution. So um, you know, it is a cleaner solution. But the problem here is the energy that you put into it to split those bonds to turn to turn water into hydrogen is more than the energy that the hydrogen has in it when you're done. <laughs> it's more than that uh, the potential that you can get out of the hydrogen. So it is always, and it is you know just the physics of the situation. It is always going to take more energy to make hydrogen this way than the energy you started with, um, and that you know creates uh, that creates a question. And I think Eric referred to that question: is if we have the energy, um, if we have that green energy, aren't we better off using it rather than uh, rather than making hydrogen out of it? And generally, we are. So, the pros and cons of green hydrogen. I mean, I think we can all um, see how the gray hydrogen, uh, uh, something that is creating carbon pollution, yeah, that's, that, that has a lot of challenges. But even if we're talking about just green hydrogen, uh, yes, it's, it doesn't have a lot of emissions. It's relatively simple to store. By weight, it's got a lot of energy in it. You know, a kilogram of hydrogen has more energy in it than a kilogram of diesel fuel. Uh, so the energy density is pretty good. And you know, it can be used as a feedstock in some industrial applications. So it, it's got some things going for it. On the downside is it's expensive. Um, it's relatively expensive compared to alternatives. Uh, it's also, and we talk about this a lot, is you really have to think about hydrogen as more like a battery and less like a fuel. Um, in almost all situations, you start with some form of energy and you store it in hydrogen. <laughs> and sometimes you need to do that and sometimes it's convenient, but it's more like a battery. It's not a new fuel source. Um, you know, by and large, you're not going to drill for hydrogen and have you know, hydrogen coming out of the ground or something like that. Or, or, uh, it's not a new fuel source. Um, also, I say, fairly poor energy density by volume. You know, a kilogram of hydrogen has a lot of energy in it, but hydrogen is a very, very light gas. You know, to get a kilogram of hydrogen, you know, you need 
you, know, you really have to have in a convenient form, you need to have it in a steel tank or some other tank, you know, at relatively high pressure to store enough to really do useful work. Um, and it's also very challenging for hydrogen and infrastructure. It is a, it is these really the lightest uh, molecule. Uh, it is a very small, very light molecule. So it leaks out of anything it could possibly leak out of. Um, you know, very hard to contain. Uh, it's also relatively reactive. So it can create problems. It can make pipes brittle and do a lot of other things, challenges for infrastructure. So very, very challenging to, uh, to handle. So given the pros and cons, um, we can jump back to where hydrogen fits in the solving the climate crisis and where do those pros and you know, balancing the pros and cons, where can we use it? This chart shows where Pennsylvania's carbon pollution is coming from. And this is from the DEP's recently released uh, climate action plan uh, and broken down, into, it broken down into broad sectors. So we can start with um, electric generation being one of the big sectors. Does hydrogen make sense in electric generation? Generally not. Um, it's again, more a battery than a fuel. You have to have, especially in green hydrogen, you have to have clean energy to start with, and then you make hydrogen out of it, and now you have less energy um, in that hydrogen. Um, not a really good solution for electrical generation, and it's unlikely it's ever going to be a major player in the electric generation market. Transportation, now, about 80, a little over 85% of the transportation pollution is coming from light duty vehicles, um, so cars and trucks. You know, can hydrogen power light duty vehicles? Yes, you can have tanks of hydrogen, you can have hydrogen fuel cells and other technologies. By and large, this is unlikely to happen. Um, it's unlikely to happen because the infrastructure to manage this is complicated and expensive. Um, you know, it's difficult enough creating electric charging stations for electric vehicles, but creating a fuel infrastructure is a much harder problem than that and a much more expensive problem. Uh, it's also not, uh, the, the technology is, would be relatively expensive compared to electric vehicles. And the fact is that electric cars and electric batteries for many applications are good enough. Um, and that, that by itself um, should keep transportation um, from really seeing a significant penetration of hydrogen. Uh, things we hear talk about hydrogen as an airline fuel and maybe potentially that will be an application, but even there it's challenging. Uh, one, the hydrogen doesn't weigh a lot. And, you know, the hydrogen has more density in it by weight than, than jet fuel does. Um, so that sounds promising, but the fact is you would need very heavy tanks in an airplane to hold that hydrogen under pressure. And that's weight that you're carrying around all the time in the aircraft. Um, so that they, tends to make it really inefficient. Um, so maybe, you know, there's an application there, um, but probably not a huge application. Uh, residential, uh, not a really good source for hydrogen. The same distribution problems as transportation. You know, we do not have the infrastructure to deliver hydrogen to houses by any means. You know, if we're going to retrofit houses, we can electrify houses more cheaply than we can retrofitting them with hydrogen. Um, industrial, now industrial is the place where, yes, we will most likely see applications. Eric mentioned the potentially the cement industry, the steel industry, things that need a fuel, need high heat. Um, yes, hydrogen could work in there. The challenge with regulating or controlling industrial emissions um, across the board though, is uh, it's very much a case by case basis and how a system is designed. In the electric generation industry, there is there are a handful of power plant designs that are out there. So if you come up with a new technology in the electric generation industry, it's probably going to apply to, you know, sometimes many hundreds of power plants that use that process. Um, maybe many thousands of power plants use that process. So if you are developing a new technology, that's a pretty efficient place to uh, field it. In the industrial use, practically every plant is different. Um, so, you know, you, there are some opportunities, maybe cement, maybe steel, that there's enough commonality 
that we can really focus a, um, a technology and make a meaningful difference there. But it's very hard to say, you know, we are hydrogen is going to decarbonize the industrial emissions in general. There's a lot of a uh, lot of things that have to be decided there on a case by case basis. So I will stop there and I will hand it back to Eric. Uh, thanks, Rob. That was great. Uh, every time I listen to Rob, I learn uh, about three new things, and this this time was no exception. Um, I, I am seeing all these great questions come up in the um, chat and the Q and A uh, little function, and I so I and I want to get to those before too long. So I'm gonna I think I'm gonna step on. I was gonna say I'm gonna step on the gas. I'm gonna step on the accelerator of my uh, of my kind of next um, speaking turn here. But I do wanted to sort of say, look, okay, I think at this point, you know, Rob has made the case, and I think I think pretty convincingly so, that hydrogen is not a good uh, fuel source, a good energy source from an environmental perspective. It's not a good fuel source from a climate perspective. Um, and it sort of doesn't even make sense kind of from an infrastructure technological development standpoint. Now, there is sort of one uh, additional argument that some people deploy in favor of hydrogen and its twin sister, uh, carbon capture. And that is, well, it will, um, it will preserve jobs in the fossil fuel industry. We've got uh, people who are working in uh, the fracking industry or in pipeline construction or in other forms of the traditional fossil fuel economy. And this would allow us to preserve those jobs and preserve that economic activity um, without the climate harm that's associated with it. So you can keep on um, fracking for gas and we'll sequester the carbon uh, at, the, at the power plant, or we can keep on even perhaps mining for coal and burning uh, coal at coal-fired power plants and sequestering the carbon and so forth. So I wanted to take you know, just an, a moment to try to take that notion seriously. Um, and um, there's, there's one response to that argument that looks at the uh, likelihood of actually developing carbon capture and sequestration that works at scale at any kind of reasonable cost. Um, maybe toward the end or in Q&A, we'll get to that because I think the, the argument um, against that possibility is actually even more decisive um, than the argument against hydrogen, um, which is to say that you know after seventy-five billion dollars or something like that of federal subsidy subsidies all over the world, and a decade or more of um, attempts to develop large-scale carbon capture, it's still not arriving. And so we will probably need we'll probably get there someday, and it will probably be relatively expensive, and we will need that carbon capture for the tiny swath of um, the economy that we can't figure out how to decarbonize anyway. So if there'd be some places where we're still using fossil fuels, carbon capture may play a, an important role in um, uh, in reducing our emissions from those sectors, but we do not have anywhere near enough capacity to store uh, carbon uh, safely or anywhere near a cost-effective point um, that would enable us to kind of continue business as usual. Now, the other reason that we don't want to continue business as usual is because uh, and this is a, a point that the Ohio River Valley Institute has made all the time. Um, the traditional fossil fuel economy has actually not produced um, positive economic growth. And I want to just, you know, I'm going to put some stuff in the chat in a moment um, to kind of, again, serve a sort of a footnote or a citation for the argument that I'm making. But uh, one of the things that uh, that my institute did was look at the 22 counties in Ohio, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia that produce. Uh, about 90% of all the gas that comes out of the Marcellus Utica region. So these are the major fracking counties. And this is this is the heart of the gas industry. And um, you know, for years, for about a decade since the, the fracking boom began, we've been told that um, this industry is producing lots and lots of jobs um, and lots and lots of economic growth. And in fact, the numbers say, um, no, that's not true at all. And so if you take those 22 counties, um, jobs in those counties uh, over the last decade crept up by 1.6%. Well, nationally, the number of jobs grew by about 10%. Um, but between, you know, over that same decade period, uh, the county's contribution to the national economy grew. They were producing a lot of sort of GDP because of all the gas that's coming out of the ground. But their share of the national economic pie actually got smaller during that period. Um, their share of the nation's personal income fell. Um, their share of jobs fell. Their share of population fell. And if we look specifically at Pennsylvania's eight big gas producing counties, so Bradford, Green, Lycoming, Sullivan, Susquehanna, Tahoga, Washington, and Wyoming, um, they, they actually do a bit, a bit better than some of the Ohio counties that really got creamed. Um, but they still did less well than the statewide average, and they lost population during the fracking boom. 
So if we look back at a decade of track record from this era of um, natural gas extraction that really goes crazy in Pennsylvania, it's not like that industry is actually delivering economic benefit, economic prosperity to the gas regions. And so it is my contention that the, that the argument that, well, hydrogen will allow us to sustain these economic activities, will allow us to sustain this industry, is actually completely unhelpful because it's sustaining an industry that has actually managed to produce underperformance in the places where it's been. Those counties that frack the most do worse than their peers. And so what we, what we don't want to do is to continue that legacy of underperformance uh, and a net economic drain, to say nothing of all the environmental impacts that go along with fracking, but just speaking directly to the economic, the purported economic benefits, they're just not there. And it gets worse because what hydrogen could do, blue hydrogen could do, CCS could do, and I think there's a very real risk of this, we'll talk about this in the federal um, legislation packages that are coming up. If we decide to go down this road where we start saying we're going to either subsidize or pay or otherwise pay for or support the development of large scale hydrogen and CCUS um, in ways that allow the gas industry to continue, which is largely what it will do. What, that would have the effect of crowding out economic activity that actually works and what actually works and what we've demonstrated again and again in Pennsylvania and many other places is the clean energy economy. For you know, each unit of energy you're producing in the clean energy economy, you're getting more jobs out of it. And that's not just in the actual production of clean energy, but that's in all the stuff that goes along with it, including energy efficiency, conservation measures, and a million other things that allow us to actually grow jobs and to actually produce wealth in local areas. Um, and so the, the crowding out risk that is associated with hydrogen and CCUS development from an economic perspective, I think is just as important than the other stuff. And so I don't want to concede uh, even for a moment that somehow uh, hydrogen and CCS are going to be, are going to uh, provide an economic benefit by sustaining an industry because that the industry that it is sustaining uh, does not have a track record that shows success. It has a track record that actually shows failure and underperformance and that is almost certainly crowding out economic activity that will work. And then of course, there are all the other reasons why lots of folks probably on this call care about um, the fracking industry and why it probably should not be sustained for purely environmental reasons. And those are super, super serious. Oh, we're not trying to elide those, but rather speak to one of the arguments that you hear all the time. And that, you know, that we've got, we've got people coming to Pittsburgh, it feels like every couple of weeks now with the latest hydrogen CCUS uh, dog and pony show, but it starts to feel a little bit like a, you know, a riverboat salesman on a Mark, in a Mark Twain novel where they're showing up the town, um, you know, pitching, uh, a set of projects and a set of ideas that just don't make a ton of sense when subjected to scrutiny. And with that, I'm going to pause this speaking turn, hand the mic back to Rob, um, and I look for, kind of forward to, um, to digging into Q&A in, in a little bit too. So, and thanks again for this. I'm really enjoying this conversation. And, and definitely thank, thank you for the people um, making the questions and, and the comments. There's a, a bunch of them are really anxious to get to, but... <coughs> Excuse me. One of the things I wanted to touch on first is this issue of subsidies. We are going to see, as uh, Eric was talking about, people showing up at Pittsburgh with business plans, plans for the industry. We are going to see um, increasing and repeated attempts to subsidize uh, to subsidize this industry. Um, and a lot of this is going to be from the fossil fuel industry itself, where we're seeing attempts to um, uh, subsidize fossil fuels. Um, so I wanted to talk about some of the subsidies and what we've seen before, and just to try to give people an idea of you know, how we look at subsidies in general and things to keep an eye out for. Uh, I wanted to flag a report that Penn Future uh, put out last February. This was an update to a report on fossil fuel subsidies uh, where we went into a lot more detail. So this is not gonna be that, the full summary of that report. Uh, I'm just picking out some things to give people an idea of what the length and breadth of the subsidy world is. Um, you know, we see this, you know, in fossil fuels, we see the PA manufacturing, uh, PA resource manufacturing tax credit. This is the Shell, uh, Shell Cracker tax credit worth over a billion dollars uh, over uh, 25 years. This is a transferable tax credit. So if the company, you know, the company buys fuel, it gets a tax credit. If it doesn't need the tax credit, it gets to sell the tax credit. Um, we also saw the same uh, model of this transferable tax credit with a local resource manufacturing credit and the coal and energy reclamation tax credit. Again, these are, these are 
you know, if companies buy a fuel or use a fossil fuel, they get a credit that they can either use themselves or sell. Now, proponents of these say, well, this is free money for Pennsylvania because the business wouldn't have located in Pennsylvania without the tax credit. So we're just getting all the benefits coming in. And, you know, so it's, we're not losing anything by giving them tax credits, which doesn't really pass the laugh test because when your business locates in the state, it is using Pennsylvania resources. Uh, often it's depleting our, in, you know, our environment and cre creating environmental damage, certainly, but it's also using roads, infrastructure, and other things that, ta that the taxpayers pay for. When it's a transferable tax credit, like many of these are, it can also, that tax credit can be sold to somebody that was paying taxes. And that reduces the amount of taxes that go into Pennsylvania's uh, coffers. And that's more that we end up paying for, everybody else ends up paying for. Um, so that's one example we see. We also see things like we don't have a sales and use tax credit for fossil fuels uh, tax. We don't have a sales, we don't pay sales tax on fossil fuels. When you go to the gas pump, you pay a vehicle tax, but you don't pay sales tax. Um, and that can create issues if, for example, electricity, a business would pay a sales tax for. So if they buy a gas powered car, they don't pay tax on the gas, sales tax on the gas. If they buy an electric car, they pay sales tax on the electricity. So there's, uh, there's incompatibilities there. We also have things like property tax exemptions where the, uh, the gas industry, you know, if you decide on your property that you're going to make a little shack and sell antiques. <laughs> you know, that increases the value of your property. Your property is gonna be assessed higher. You're paying more taxes. If you put a gas well on your property, well, you're not gonna be assessed more and you're not gonna be paid higher taxes because we don't, that gas has a special exemption from uh, those sorts of tax assessments. Um, um, you know, certainly lack of a severance tax is another thing, you know, we're not, we don't have a severance tax for gas, um, you know, so we simply don't tax them. Um, a lot of people, a lot of people in the fossil fuel industry claim things like these tax breaks are not subsidies. Uh, they just don't define them as subsidies. Uh, I've, you know, found a wonderful quote here from Charles Koch, who's no, no uh, environmentalist, I think by any standard, but he clearly understands that all of these things are subsidies. Uh, whether they're tax credits uh, or, or other benefits that are given to special industries. There's a very broad range of them. Now, not all subsidies are bad. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's, a matter, it's a buyer beware situation. Uh, what we tend to talk about is, you know, what we want to do is invest in what we need. We need sustainable, industries, sustainable jobs for citizens. So we should be focusing our investments in things that develop sustainable jobs. We need to promote environmental justice and, and, and address the historic disparity where communities, particularly communities of color, have had the brunt of environmental harms over the years. We need to invest in programs that address that. We, need, we know that things like we have one conventional steam coal plant in Pennsylvania that has not announced plans to close or refuel. Mm -hmm. um, so Homer City is the only one left. Um, that's, you know, we know these plants are closing. We know that's going to affect the workers and communities in those plants. Um, we need to do things that invest in those workers and communities. So those sorts of subsidies can be good <laughs> if, we, if, we, if we focus on those issues. Um, you know, so short version of what we're looking for when we think about subsidies, again, know what we're paying for, realize we don't need to pollute to grow the economy. Um, that might have been true in the 1950s. It's not true today. We should put the cost of pollution on the source of pollution <laughs> and you know, basically stop buying more pollution with our tax dollars. Um, and generally invest in people, uh, not, you know, invest in people in the future, not, in, not, in, not use our tax dollars and our resources to make existing profitable industry more profitable for their owners. So with that, I will stop. I'll hand it back to Eric and then hopefully get into questions. Uh, great. I, I'm just having so much fun uh, 
tracking uh, everything that's going on in chat in the Q&A right now, because I think lots of, of good and interesting questions being asked. Um, so I, I'm actually going to um, uh, try to be relatively concise with um, this this portion before we move into Q&A. Um, I, I was sort of asked to, to talk about um, potential subsidies um, uh, for hydrogen outside of Pennsylvania and uh, uh, at the federal level. Um, you know, it's, it's very difficult to track the federal legislation right now with the Build Back Better, um, with, with the infrastructure package and the Re reconciliation uh, bill, it, because it seems like it's going through a blender uh, just about every day and coming out in a little bit different form. And we're going to see, I think, another version of it today, it sounds like. Um, but suffice it to say that we're likely to see um, very substantial uh, federal subsidies uh, for both hydrogen development and for CCUS. Um, and that will take the, the form of um, both uh, several billion dollars, maybe as many as $3.5 billion for the development of um, carbon capture hubs, uh, which may, again, may have a, may have a specific use. Um, and, and then also some tax credits. Um, and, this, and the tax credits gets really concerning because the tax credits will be directed toward um, uh, facilities or industries um, that are uh, either capturing the carbon or producing hydrogen. Uh, and particularly for capturing uh, carbon. Now that gets really tricky because um, I'm gonna put just one more link in the chat where the Ohio Valley Institute has looked at the cost of using uh, CCUS for this stuff and finds that it would drive up electricity bills dramatically um, or they will be covered by federal subsidies which just means the taxpayers are, are, are paying for it. Um, and you know, it might be a fine thing to just throw money uh, at the clean energy economy. God knows we need to do everything we can as fast as we possibly can. But remember that this could actually just facilitate the crowding out of clean energy production um, that can be much cheaper and much more effective and doesn't have any of the associated risks that hydrogen and CCUS does. Um, I did want to respond briefly to a couple of things that have come up in chat because I think they're smart questions uh, and deserve a little bit of attention. So one notion is the notion that um, one of the difficulties with um, conventional forms of clean energy production, wind and solar, is that um, we lack uh, adequate storage capacity for those. And so to the extent that hydrogen could serve as a battery, as Rob indicated, well, isn't, isn't that a good thing? Uh, and I think that's a, that's a really interesting question. And what I would say to that is, Maybe, maybe in some cases, it could be a, a good um, sort of battery source. Um, there are lots of other things we can do, though, to distribute the electricity to the places it's needed when it's needed. Um, and it's not the case that in a place like Pennsylvania, this is actually an, it, an issue for the most part, because um, what you can say so in, the, in the Pacific Northwest, I'll, just to give one example, that you've got a ton of hydroelectricity that is sometimes producing power when there's not actually not enough demand on the grid for all the power. And so the dams get, or wind, sometimes wind development gets what they call curtailed uh, and that power is not produced. It is conceivable that that zero carbon form of power, instead of curtailing, it could be used to produce hydrogen. And then the hydrogen could serve as a sort of um, backup storage for, so that, that could be then used to generate power when the region needs it. Um, that's a good that's a good problem to have it's not the problem that pennsylvania has the problem that pennsylvania has is that the portfolio of um of power is um largely driven by coal and gas which everyone knows and so what we don't want to do is use those existing sources of dirty energy to try to do two things produce energy uh in the form of hydrogen at a high energy cost and then try to sequester um that carbon uh at a at a high financial cost uh, it with which is sort of and it's an unproven sort of technology and development anyway. Now I think again I want to I'm going to close my remarks with this and then we can go to Q and I, I don't want the takeaway from this to be that Eric DePlace or the Ohio River Valley Institute hates hydrogen or hates carbon capture or thinks that there's no application for it or anything like that. That's not what I'm saying. There are some sectors of the economy that we can decarbonize, the, the mo most of the economy, we can decarbonize pretty easily. We know how to decarbonize the transportation sector. We know how to decarbonize the power sector. We know how to decarbonize other things. And that gets us two thirds, three quarters of the way, maybe more towards success. There are some parts of the economy we don't know how to decarbonize yet. Maybe we'll figure it out someday, but it's, it is difficult to figure out how we decarbonize a few kinds of industrial applications. And maybe that's 15% of our problem. Maybe it's 20% of our problem. That's where green hydrogen might make sense. And I say might because I think Rob made some really kind of you know nuanced and thoughtful, raised some thoughtful objections to why that might not make sense even there. Um, and those are the kind of places where we might need carbon capture and sequestration too. 
So um, because there are some se segments of our economy that we don't know how to decarbonize, that's where we need to direct. But uh, if we're going to have green hydrogen, if we're going to have or blue hydrogen, or if we're going to have carbon capture, we really need to focus it on those areas where we don't know how to decarbonize. Because if we allow that stuff to be spread across the other sectors of the economy, transportation and power in particular, it's gonna be, we will not have enough. We will not have enough carbon capture. We will not have enough hydrogen without creating all kinds of other problems. And so you know, my argument is not no hydrogen ever or no carbon capture ever. It's let's focus it where we really need it and not get distracted by using it to prolong an industry and a process fracking, gas development, coal mining, the rest of it that is outdated and needs to go away at this point. So I'm going to stop there. We've, we are I, approaching the end of the hour, I guess, and um, I want to give space for um, other folks to chime in and object and raise questions and so forth. Um, thanks again. Uh, this is Jared Stonecipher. I'm Penn Futures Director of Media Relations. Thank you to everyone for joining. I hope you found it very educational for what can be a, a pretty heavy topic. So uh, I know that I see that Rob is in the, the, the Q&A right now answering some questions. I know Eric was in the chat answering some questions. So uh, we have about uh, 10 minutes left. We'll do our best to get to uh, some of the questions uh, or most of them if we can. Uh, Eric, you just mostly touched on this right before the Q&A session started, but we had an anonymous user ask, are there some industrial uses such as making steel or cement where hydrogen would make sense. Uh, and again, I know that both of you touched on that briefly in your presentations, but if you could uh, go forth on that a little bit more, I think that that would be great. Yeah, I'll, I'll let Rob take a crack at it in just a moment. So I'll do a 30 second version, which is, yes, there are some places where it, it right? If we look at sort of the, the, the most sophisticated decarbonization pathways analysis, what, and there are a bunch of these that have been produced for different regions and for the country, it, it turns out to be pretty challenging to address a small set of industrial applications and steel and cement are often cited as some of those. Um, they produce, they actually produce uh, CO2 in a couple of different ways. Um, what, like the actual manufacturing process the, or the reagency process can produce uh, carbon emissions and it requires a high heat inputs of um, certain kinds of fuels. Um, we can solve some of that problem with uh, hydrogen maybe. Um, and so it's it's in that segment, and I think it's you know it's often sort of described as about twenty percent of our emissions portfolio, where where I think it's I think there's a, a legitimate question mark, and we might want to direct uh, our hydrogen our CCUS technology to the extent that it's available at all, which again is not a sure thing, um, to the, to those uses, and again sort of keep it away from the places that we can easily decarbonize, and by decarbonizing you know solve all these other problems about air pollution and water pollution and blah, 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 blah. Uh, maybe Rob has some more to, to add to that. I would say we have a lot of other questions to get to, so. Sounds good. I see that Matt Mahalik from the Breathe Project out here in Pittsburgh asked, what risks occur from the current push to subsidize with federal money, large scale underground storage of hydrogen, like is being proposed in Ohio, essentially trying to adapt an ethane storage project to include a hydrogen storage project? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's you know, the the risks associated with it are, um, are, are one, it's going to be super expensive. Now we may be in a in a place now with federal policy where we just don't care about the price tags anymore, and 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 there's you know maybe there's a debate that we should just throw money at stuff and fine. So let's even if we set aside the costs and just say taxpayers are going to pay an absurd price for reducing carbon emissions when there are lots of cheaper and easier ways to do it. Um, that still leaves the problem that we we do not, and by we I mean humans do not yet know how to develop large scale carbon capture that actually works and is secure. We do know how to decarbonize the economy really easily. We know how to produce clean energy. We know how to invest in energy efficiency. We know how to do all these other things that give you guaranteed emissions reductions right away, immediately, and put people to work. Um, but for some reason, and I have a suspicion that the answer to this, why it's, the, what the some reason is, is it's the gas industry. The gas industry and others want to continue business as usual. They want to prolong fracking. They want to prolong pipeline construction. They want to prolong all the rest of it. And then kind of, quote unquote, solve that problem or attempt to solve it by building an even bigger piece of unreliable infrastructure in the form of hydrogen storage underground. Um, that again, just it has, it has not been demonstrated at scale to work. And so the risks associated with that are all the risks that um, go along with uh, the fracking uh, economy. 
um, and and a bunch of others. But uh, you know, Matt, I think that's a, a very well posed question. I think it's the question that ought to be posed over and over again to the proponents of this stuff. So thank you for asking it. And Jared, I, to, I guess short circuit, you're jumping on, uh, jumping on to another question. I've seen a whole bunch of questions on store, energy storage from a whole bunch of different angles that I know we're not gonna have time to get to all of the questions. Um, I think I, I, I think I can address a lot of uh, maybe a lot of them quickly. I mean, yes, we talk about hydrogen as a battery. Hydrogen is a potential storage solution, and it can potentially work for um, you know com combined with renewable energy, green hydrogen, um, creating green hydrogen and using that in energy storage, and then using that for applications is a very viable thing that might happen. Question we keep coming back to in a lot of these storage issues is, is this something that is going to be scalable enough to address a meaningful part of what we need to do to get to the climate crisis? Not, will it work in this application or that application? You know, will it work in, there was a commentator that said, will it work in the centrally fueled fleet environment? Maybe it will. You know, are centrally fueled fleets of the big enough part of the problem that's going to justify a huge investment in this. I mean, maybe we'll do it. You know, we'll you know investing in investing in this is one thing, but it's not going to be the thing that solves the climate crisis, or it's not going to be maybe a huge player in it. Um, that's part of the issue with storage. Uh, another uh, issue is uh, we talk about storage. Yes, you know, current battery technology, lithium technology. There's challenges. There's challenges with that. Um, storage is a broader is a broader system than lithium battery technology. I mean, there's other technologies like pump water storage and flywheels. And um, every time I think I pick up a magazine, I hear a new battery technology on the horizon. So there's a lot of potential things that are out there. Uh, what, one of the things that we tried to focus on at the beginning is what do we have today that we can invest in? A, Technology that may be effective 10 years from now is too late to address the climate crisis. You know, we, need to be in, we need to be moving the ball forward and away from polluting fossil fuels today. Um, so yeah, after you know, 2050, we might have a hydrogen economy that looks very different than what we're talking about now. Um, but you know, the question is, it, are we confident we will have those technologies in a cost-effective manner quickly enough to address the crisis we're facing. Great, thank you, Rob. Uh, a question for my own edification. There's a lot of talk from the fossil fuel industry in Pennsylvania about retrofitting pipelines in Pennsylvania for use in hydrogen. Is that feasible? Is that kind of technology available right now? Is that something that advocates should be on the lookout for as, as fossil fuels look to use hydrogen uh, to, to their own benefit? Well, first of all, as we mentioned, hydrogen is the smallest and lightest molecule and it will leak out of literally everything. <laughs> the, it is really, really hard to contain hydrogen. Uh, so if we have leakage issues with existing pipelines and we do, they will be worse with hydrogen. Um, so that is a problem. Um, what you, one of the things that you'll hear the gas industry do is say, well, we're not gonna have the, we're not gonna make hydrogen pipelines. We're going to blend gas and hydrogen in the pipeline. Um, so, and that will maybe address some of the issues where hydrogen exposed to certain metals and certain components in the pipeline makes them brittle and crack. Um, and, but if you mix it with gas, then you know, it's not dense enough to do that. Yeah, there's these potentials to pipeline around hydrogen doing that kind of thing, but that's the transportation part of it. You also need the infrastructure part. Then you need what is that hydrogen going to flow to and what are you going to do with it? Um, there's been things like, are we going to retrofit all our houses um, that are currently have gas furnaces to hydrogen furnaces? It would be cheaper to retrofit them to electrify them. <laughs> there really isn't a, a you know, clear use case. You know, could hydrogen theoretically work in that situation? Yes, it could. Would it, does it look like it will practically work given the technology and the economy we have today? Probably not. Um, and right, and, uh, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna maybe make that, I'm gonna <laughs> dial that up by a moment. Like it, it's a, the, the use case for, for piping hydrogen or hydrogen gas blends to our homes is bananas. I mean, it would, it would either you're gonna get massive amounts of leakage that re require 
retrofitting and replacing every single distribution pipeline that's under every city street, which is an, an undertaking that would run into the trillions. I don't even know how many zeros you'd have to put on the end of that. There's so many cheaper ways. Um, or you, or the hydrogen is blended with gas and you're still burning methane in everyone's homes. And it, ju it just goes to sort of demonstrate the point we've been making all along. It doesn't solve the problem. Like it, it, all it does is prolong the gas industry. Um, and you and you end up with all the other associated benefit or you know negative kind of problems that go along with it. So it's it like you using uh, and and then and then there's corrosion issues and all kinds of stuff like that. But I, I think that the, the one of the most sort of just flat out crazy um, uh, possible uses of hydrogen is to use it in in home heating applications. Um, because our existing infrastructure is not like you could you could construct a city that was built that way, but we have not we don't have those cities and we're not and building them now in our existing cities would um, we, you could literally I mean you could you could solve the entire climate crisis probably for less money than that would cost. I'm ranting a little bit because we're near the end of the hour, but um, that that one drives me crazy. So. Uh, as Eric mentioned, we are uh, at the end of the hour. I show uh, 12.59. So uh, if folks do want a recording of this, please feel free to email me. My email address was in the chat, or you can visit Penn Futures website and find my information there. More than happy to share it, but thank you everyone for the great questions. Thank you everyone for the participation. Uh, thank you to our panelists who uh, made some time to, to educate folks on this. And um, thank you very much. I appreciate uh, everyone coming out. <laughs>